Good order here. It looks like in seat one, we have Eric Afria from Montreal, Canada, with 2,280,000 in chips. Our next player up, Mr. Steven Song in seat five. He's from Greenwich, Connecticut. He's got 2,740,000 in chips. Steve Song. In seat six, Michael Martyr from Sewell, New Jersey, with 3,080,000 chips. In seat four, from Clearwater, Florida, with 5.565 million. Seat four, Justin Zaki. In seat three, our self-proclaimed Billy Goat, that's right. Joe McKeon from North Wales, Pennsylvania, with 5.955 million in chips. Everyone knows Joe. And our chip leader for today's final table, Zach Grunenberg from Bowlesburg, Pennsylvania, with over 17.6 million in chips today. We're currently at level 30 players with 63 minutes remaining on our clock. Our blinds at 15, 50, and 100. Down to six. Let's see who's going to take down this championship event. Thanks for joining us, players. You can shuffle up and deal. Have fun, boys. Hello everybody on YouTube and Facebook. This is Kane Callis alongside me, Mike Gagliano. And we are here at the final table of the Borgata Winter Poker Open 2018. And uh, we have a very talented uh, group of players here at the final table. Uh, right now the chip counts very, very one-sided. Zachary Grunberg, the uh, pro from State College has most of the chips in play here, and, and Mike, what do you, th what kind of dynamic do you think that that this will have here at the final table, with one player having so many of the chips in play? This is going to be a fun one to watch play out, Kane. Uh, all these players are very experienced. They are pretty much all professionals. Uh, I don't think Eric considers himself professional, but he's played his more than his fair share of poker tournaments with a lot of success. So uh, he's definitely no uh, no no newcomer to the felt. With a big chip lead like this. We're going to see a lot of aggression from Zach, I would think. He's probably going to try to push around these stacks that are trying to just, you know, move up the ladder, make a few extra bucks here, and try to really seal this tournament. But I don't know if you remember a year and a half ago, we had a very similar situation at the World Poker Tour back here in September. Uh, we had one player with about 50% of the chips in play, and that player finished in sixth place. So anything can happen. Let's, uh, let's, let's, let's see what happens here. So we got Eric entering the pot here with the ace nine. Steven defending the seven four suited. This is a, always an interesting spot here when you defend. You flop bottom pair. Um, you know what? What are you thinking here when facing a, a continuation bet? Well, it's not the flop he dreamed up, but it's likely not going to be a flop that he's going to fold on. Um, in any heads up pot, usually any pair is worth at least seeing another card and kind of seeing what happens. Um, both these players are not super deep, you know, I mean, and this really shows you how weak, you know, bottom pair mo really is here. I mean, it's the best turn in the deck for, for a hand like Steven has, and he's, I mean, what's he going to do if Eric bets again? Probably just fold. Eric, it's going to be uh, tough for him to continue here, but it looks like he's certainly thinking about it. He bets 300,000 here, and you're absolutely right, Steven. Quickly folds, and Eric uh, Gresham pays off there, taking down the first pot with just ace high, no draw. Eric is not going to be one of those players that's going to ladder up today, I think. I think we're going to see a lot of aggression from him. Uh, he does have a WPT victory, and how many other final tables does he have in WPTs? I believe three others, not including this one. Um, Four so others, not including this one. Oh, there he is. That's uh, Brian Paris. Joining us as well. I was, I was wondering if you were there. I, we, we were unsure. Brian is joining us remotely from Amsterdam. Good to have you here. Thanks, man. Yeah, good to be here. This is my first uh, U.S. WPT I'll be commentating, but he nice has, to uh, get a glimpse of what goes on in my home country here. Yeah, Eric has, uh, uh, he is a, it looks like he's a first, third, fifth, and sixth. Um, and then this final table as well. So this is, uh, looks like it's his fifth final table he's made. 
in nope. a World Poker Tour event. Yeah, especially the only one that doesn't consider himself a professional. Nah, I think any professional would love to have that resume. Now, Brian, you, you play uh, mostly online out there in Holland? Now, do you play a lot in the United States or, or not as much? Wow, congratulations. I think we're going to see another Eric victory here. Yeah, I expect we'll see a small C-bet from Eric. This is the type of board that the big one is going to miss Eric most of the time. The there it is, very small C-bet. Should be enough to do the trick. Yeah, I heard you can get a shot at that commanding chip weed that Zach has. Now, is that a, is that a board that you guys would always see bet there with the ace queen, or might you just uh, try to check it down there? I think as long as you're c betting small, you should mostly be c betting there, simply because if you think about the way the big blind uh, hands look when he defends out of the big blind, he's just gonna have so many hands to connect with the flop. Uh, it's pretty advantageous to pick up right there. It's like yeah, it depends on the kind of strategy you want to play. Some guys are a lot more comfortable playing uh, check check pots, and I think if you're, you know, that type, uh, maybe seeing some turns in rivers is not the worst idea. And you know, you can get your opponent to make mistakes. You know, if your opponent has a hand like queen ten or queen jack, he's just going to fold in the flop. But you know, hey, maybe you hit a queen and then you get paid off with your ace queen. Right. Um, I, I, th I think I would have checked there uh, simply because I don't expect I expect my opponent to continue with all better and fold all worse. Yeah, I think it's just kind of a, there's definitely just different strategies. I think that like one of the more common strategies now is just like bet very frequently and bet very small. Um, you know, there's 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 merit to both. There's not a right or wrong way to play, I don't think. Um, I think it'd be interesting to see who which of these players, you know, kind of uses the different strategies. Um, so Eric is going to win his third pot in a row. Uh, all three pots here going to Eric. Uh, Eric is from Montreal, uh, but he is, like we said, a very familiar face here on the World Poker Tour. Let's see here. He does have Zachary on his left, which is going to constrain his options a little bit going forward, but he is off to a very nice start here. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think that for a lot of players that might, you know, slow them down. But I, like, I, I don't think Eric is that type. You know, I think Eric is the type that's like, oh, you have a lot of chips. You want to try to push me around? Let's go. Let's play a big pot. Yeah, when you've been here five times, it's a lot easier to uh, yeah. go for the win. Speaking of being here a lot of times, uh, I think we got to talk about Joe McKeon. Joe McKeon adding another major final table to his already incredibly impressive resume. Uh, all these players are actually very accomplished. Yeah, Joe's track record is simply amazing. I mean, not, even if you take the World Series main event out of it entirely, his, his uh, resume is still incredibly yeah, impressive overall. Yeah, for sure. So Justin coming in for a 2.5 X raise here with the Ace King. Zach and the Big Wong going to defend Queen Jack of Hearts. Our flop is Jack of Spades, Nine of Hearts, Queen of Hearts, Queen of Hearts, Queen of Hearts, Jack 9 4, good flop for Zach, who checks it over to Justin. And I assume that Justin will be looking to continuation bet here with Big Slick. He doesn't, he checks back. What do you guys think about checking back this board here? I, I like the check. It's a pretty bad board for his ace king, especially with no spade. Um, you know, this is also a board that, you know, a lot of those mid, uh, those high, middle high cards tends to hit the big blind defending range. Um, again, it wouldn't surprise me if a lot of players do see bet ace king in this spot just because they want to bet a lot. And that's okay. You got two over still, but you just don't get that many folds. It's also harder to bet uh, light into the chip leader here just because Zach has so many more options as far as, like, check raising to put Justin stack in a really tough spot to continue. Kind of surprised Zach to just, will win it on the turn there. Yeah, kind of surprised to uh, just, just fold with the uh, gut shot to the nuts, including the overs. Um, now, is that is uh, in that spot, when you're Justin, 
but you think about it differently being at a final table with ICM considerations versus if you're just playing a cash game there facing a, a bet on the turn with Ace-King. Yeah, definitely a little bit. I mean, you, you just can't splash too much in general. I mean, all these stacks are like, I don't want to say they're shorter because a lot of guys have like 50 big blinds still, but they're short in comparison to what um, what Zach has. And when that's the case, you, you really can't get too splashy. You don't want to become the shortest stack. You kind of want to keep... You know, keep your ground, keep trying to claw your way up the, the chip ladder um, to, to try to take a shot at, at Zach. And so every kind of, you know, 300, 400,000 bet that you're just kind of tossing out there and not winning very often, it does hurt you. So I don't mind it uh, with that in mind. Um, but it's just kind of like a spot that, like, you just don't really love, you know. You still got an okay hand. Zach could easily just be bluffing with a straight or a flush draw. So... Here we have Eric opening the button with ace, ten of hearts. Zach, jack, nine of spades in the small blind, contemplating a, a three bet here. And he actually just opts to call. That's kind of interesting. Joe McKeon with an interesting hand in the big blind. Ace, ten suited. Do, are we, do you expect him to, to three bet in this spot? I think Joe's just going to call. He yeah. does just call. Joe is, you know, you can see from his resume, he navigates a lot of these tough fields. Uh, Joe is not the type to, I don't want to say get out of line, but he's going to step very carefully. He's going to pick his bluffs very carefully. When he puts a lot of money in, he's going to have a good reason to do so. Brian, I would have three bet out of both the small blind and the big blind in this hand. What do, what do you think about both players calling? Um, it's definitely, I mean, both hands are quite strong, but I think as uh, Mike was just saying, Joe is definitely going to take the lower variance option as far as like playing post flop instead of, you know, inflating the pots pre flop. He's, he's very accomplished. You know, he, he trusts in his ability to navigate these post flop spots. I think the deeper the, the pots play post flop, the better for Joe. Uh, as far as a small blind, it, it's closer. I don't know. It, it's definitely a spot where Zach could look to apply pressure, but I think calling is also going to be fine. The hand flops pretty well. As Zach as the ship leader, I, I would always choose the aggressive route, personally. Um, but I think the problem is that that allows Eric to just four bit shove on. Yeah, you for sure. Well, we'll see a river. And as as we've said, Eric is not the type of guy who's going to bow down to ICM exactly. pressure very easily. I, I found it pretty interesting that Eric checked this flop, flopping top pair in the flush draw like this, especially three ways. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Call me crazy, guys, but with Eric opening the button, he's he's opening very wide. Uh, Zach, I'd expect to three bet most of his strong stuff. So if I'm Joe in the big blind there, I'd be pouncing on it. But Joe, as played, will win half the pot. Should be notable that Eric checked back the flop there with top pair and the nut flush draw. Definitely an interesting check from Eric there. So as you can see, the chip distribution, Zach with. 174 big blinds and everybody else just kind of battling anywhere from 27 Michael Martyr at the bottom to Joe McKeon second place in chips with 62 big blinds but uh, so when you're when you're somebody other than Zach at this final table are you thinking about first place maybe trying to you know uh, have some something big change or are you just thinking you know what if I take second or third place that would be fantastic that's what I'm going to try to do I think it depends on what spot you're in. I mean, if you're look, look at Joe. Joe is sitting to the left of the chip waiter. He has a fairly good chip stack. He's got over 60 big blinds still. Winning this tournament is not out of reach for Joe, not by any stretch of the imagination. You know, if you're Mike down there in six with only 22 big blinds, I'd say in this scenario against five very good tough opponents, you know, getting second or third is probably a pretty good accomplishment. Um, you know, so it's kind of just the way they came into this final table. Um, like I said, when it started, anything can happen, so it's definitely still anyone's game. Brian, how would you think about that? Joe... Yeah, it'll be interesting to see Joe navigate the spot. It's kind of the inverse of what he had at the World Series main event when he won, where he just had the absolutely massive chip lead and kind of dominated the whole final table from wire to wire. Uh, now he gets that position on Zach in the same spot, so he's going to kind of get to play the, uh, the other side of the situation. So it'll be interesting to see how he navigates it here. If you were if you were in Joe's seat, would you be thinking, have, having your eye on kind of second place, just getting heads up with a uh, you know with a chip disadvantage, and then seeing what happens there? Or are I mean, you that's still a pretty good outcome for him, but he definitely is going to have spots where he's going to be able to, uh, you know, sort of sort of put extra pressure on Zach's super weak ranges. The Zach will be playing as the big stack, so I, I think I think Joe can definitely step out of line a little bit before getting heads up, you know, and try to solidify his second place status. 
I think it's interesting too. I mean, we're only starting this final table six-handed. You know, if we were looking at a nine-handed final table, there's a lot more that could be said for hey, let's you know wait till we're shorter-handed before we make some moves. They're already six-handed. You know, it's kind of time to make some moves here if you're planning on winning this thing. And I don't think we're going to see Joe back down too much here, especially if you know one or two of the shorter stacks gets knocked out. Well, we are. We are. Well, we just did just see Zach open the button with eight deuce offsuit, so Joe's definitely going to have his his chances to uh, abuse that sort of strategy if he wants to. Right, and I'm sure that Joe has a, a friend or family member watching the stream, and he's going to be learning information about uh, about that, learning that Zach is opening the button that wide. But since we are down to six-handed, uh, Mike, what that means is that the pay jumps are even more considerable. I mean, just going from sixth place to fifth place is a $43,000 pay jump, or about uh, 30%. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of money in these jumps, but in relation to that first place, I don't think the jumps are actually that big. Um, up until you get to, I mean, heads up is first place is 637,000, we'll call it, um, you know, plus the Tournament of Champions buy-in. And then second place is 400 and about 35,000. You know, so, so that's a big difference right there, that, that $200,000 difference. So yeah, sure, 40,000 is a lot for everybody, but the biggest jump is still going to be that second, the first. And, I mean, winning a WPT is, you know, you, you can't put a, a big value on that. You get you get to go on the trophy. You know, you're in the Champions Club for life. Then there, there's, there's definitely uh, reasons to go for the win here. Something I did notice, though, with the, um, with the payouts of this tournament, since uh, compared to when I final tabled the Borgata Poker Open, uh, several years ago, is that it's actually a much more level structure, much less top heavy. Uh, it, when it, I when I final tabled that tournament, first place was eight hundred and thirty thousand, and it had a hundred fewer entrants than this one. Yeah, so the the past structures have been adjusted over the years. Um, I believe World Poker Tour is using this type of payout structure for I want to say all of their events. Um, it pays a few more places, and it tends to be a little bit more of a a little bit more of an even distribution at the final table. Uh, there's still definitely large jumps in first place. is still tremendous. Uh, I personally think that this power structure is nearly perfect. Um, I, I think this is much better. You know, the one that you mentioned. When you're playing first, yeah, having an $800,000 first place is amazing. But what happens is second is 400, and then third becomes like 200. And it's just you're not spreading the money around. There's just two big jumps. You're playing for way too much. Um, I think that when you have more even payouts, you actually see better poker being played. People aren't as concerned about the jumps. They're just kind of in there. They're saying, hey, there's some good jumps, but I want to win this tournament. Um, so I think you actually see a lot more fierce competition when there's, you know, kind of a, a more even payout like we have here. So here we have we Zach. Zach with a fairly loose, I mean, not really a loose open, I guess, King-4 suited, King suited on the cutoff, pretty standard. We saw Joe just flat the button with Ace-Jack, so he's not really looking to inflate the variance too much in these type of spots, it would seem. Yeah, inter interesting check call by, by Zach here. Nah, it's pretty standard with the gut shot, backdoor flush draw, and overcard. And I'm, he gets there on the turn. So we'll I'm a little surprised to see uh, Zach not see bet here. Right. Uh, I, I am surprised to see Joe bet there with, uh, with Justin entering out of the small blind as well. Yeah, I'm a little bit surprised to see Joe bet the flop for sure. Interesting run out now. Joe gets there again on the river, so... Zach's lucky turn is not going to hold up for him here. I would have loved to see uh, Justin have raised the flop. I think he was thinking about it. What was his hand? That is his hand. Pocket force. Yeah, Justin had a pretty strong hand to be folding this flop, but he was wedged in an awkward spot because he had to act before Zach. And with his stack, it's difficult for him to want to get two out of line. Joe makes a bet. 465. Uh, you hear that chirping type of sound in the background there. Uh, that is the action clock. We haven't talked about that much yet. You want to fill us in on your experiences with the action clock, Kane? Yeah, so this is my first tournament playing with the action clock. Uh, each player gets 30 seconds for every decision. Um, and then after that, uh, they must use one of their time chips. So if you can see the chips that are in play, the blue chips are worth 5,000, uh, have 5,000 chip equivalent. The um, pink ones are 25,000, the yellow ones are 100,000, and as you can see, uh, everybody has these plaques next to their stack. Those are time chips, and here at the final table, each player 
has been given eight time chips. So if they need more time to think about a decision, they uh, simply throw in a time chip and they get 30 additional seconds for each time chip. So each player basically has a, a four minute time bank here at the final table. Now that, that 30 seconds is every decision that they have, whether it's pre-flop, post-flop, you know, facing a river all in, you have 30 seconds to act plus 30 seconds per time chip. But again, you only get eight time chips here at the final table, and they actually uh, started, they put those into play right when we got down to the bubble. And um, what they did is we, we got, we were allotted four time chips uh, from the bubble until we got down to 24 players, 27 players. Um, and then we were allotted six from then until the final table, and now uh, the remaining six players have eight time chips for the final table. Seeing Justin come in for a two and a half X open here. Michael will defend the big one with 10 8 offsuit. That action clock, of course, provided by Protection Poker. And it's been quite, uh, I think it's been overall very well received. The WPT has been using this all season. Uh, I got to play with it a, a handful of times. It's been, it's been great. Uh, it does speed the action up. Um, the one thing that I noticed is that the larger pots don't take as much time as they used to. I don't think there's a big difference in small pots. People tend to play pretty quick in those. But those larger pots, you just lose that excessive tanking when, you know, facing a seabed or when deciding to seabed, um, you know, stuff like that. It seems like a pretty good system. It seems, you know, generous enough that it's not really punishing people who are a little bit more deliberate, but it's also nice just to put some amount of a uh, downside on tanking too long. For certain uh, so I haven't actually played it yet myself, but it does seem like a pretty good innovation to me. A couple of questions from the uh, the YouTube chat here. Uh, Dan M asks, how are the players' seats assigned? And that's a really good question. So tournament seats throughout the whole tournament are randomly drawn when you register you're given a random seat and as players bust uh, they break tables which means that you know when there's players are generally tables generally nine-handed when there's nine open seats they come by with seat cards and randomly give out uh, one to each person at the table and they find their new seats uh, so when the tournament gets down to uh, when did you guys redraw? 24, right? Because yeah. you were eight-handed. Yeah, so once this tournament gets down to 80 players uh, they actually change the tables to eight-handed and when the tournament gets down to 24 the entire tournament is randomly redrawn again. Um, players are then in these same seats until they break a table, down the two tables, down the one table, and it's just like that. Um, so these players have been in these seats since this final table of... Uh, the final table was 9 or 10? 9, I believe. Final table is 9. Yeah. Stephen calling the button here. King Queen. Stephen calls King Jack of Clubs. Yeah, Brian, would you do you like that call, or would you have been looking at three bet this hand? Um, I I would need to know Steven's exact stack size, but I believe it seems he's got like about a reasonable call. Two point five million. Uh, okay, his so graphic, he's got about twenty five big ones. Yeah, so Steven's actually pretty. I don't want to say short, but he's one of the shorter stacks. Uh, the graphic was wrong. We initially started the tournament, uh, or started the final the broadcast here. Whoa, and here comes Eric with a 3-bet to 850,000 with 6-3 offsuit. Eric certainly playing fearless at this final table, and both other players snap -pulled. Wow. The amateur teaching him a thing or two here. Power poker there by Eric, making uh, it uh, just about 4x, with, uh, choosing the 6-3 offsuit to do it. I think he was going to do that regardless of what he looked down at. Got to say, I don't you think that 6-3 was at, uh, his choice. You want to choose the hand where the opportunity cost of not flatting is lower? Like, if you had a hand like 7-9 suited or whatever, you have a very profitable flat there. With 6-3 offsuit, the, the EV of flatting is not so good. So the cost of turning it into a 3-bet bluff and potentially getting 4-bet shoved off your equity, it's just not that big of a, a cost. Oh, you. So, Brian, well, I, I've, I've noticed this. Not, uh, foregoing that much opportunity cost. I've noticed, I've noticed a lot of good players doing this uh, lately, is what they'll do is they'll take the strongest hand that they otherwise would fold out of the big blind, and they turn that into their 3-bet. We actually saw this... Uh, last year in this tournament at the final table where Dan Weinman uh, chose to three bet against Tyler Kenny in the big blind with five nine offsuit uh, and then he ended up making a, an amazing uh, call down um, to eliminate Tyler Kenny. Is that something that you see frequently online as well? Yeah, definitely uh, definitely seeing a lot more three betting out of the big blind lately. Um, 
and yeah, people are mostly structuring their ranges in the way that you said. That was a crazy hand, by the way. That that hand was just insane. That is one of the better World Poker Tour hands I've seen. That I saw that clip yeah, floating around on Twitter the other day. That's a good absolutely. one. For those that haven't well, seen it, go check that out. I had uh, sort of surface recently. Uh, so let's talk a little more about these players. I don't think we gave uh, you know tremendous introductions to anybody here. Uh, we see Michael Michael Martyr uh, opening the button here with the Queen Ten off. Uh, Michael is an East Coast, well-known East Coast player. Uh, if you're not from the East Coast, you may not recognize him, but uh, he's definitely well-known here at the Borgata. He's been playing poker full-time for six years. He is from Sewell, New Jersey. As you can see in the top left of your screen there, a little promo for the Deep Stacks Challenge. If you like one-day tournaments, nothing beats Borgata Deep Stacks Challenge. The Deep Stacks Challenge returns... February 21st through March 2nd, with over $250,000 in guarantees over 10 events. We got to get you over here, Brian, playing some of these deep stacks. Yeah, one, of the, one of these days, I'll come back. It's not so good for the taxes here to be playing in the States, which is why I mostly play in the EU these days. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll move back at some point, and I'll get on the U.S. live scene again. Zach makes a bit of an awkward two-pair here with the four-card straight, but looks like he's going to bet it anyway. Small bet from Zach. Yeah, he would have been better off bluff catching against this exact hand, but reasonable enough spot to go for a little yeah, bit of value. I think Mike can have an ace here. Down. Mike could easily have an ace that, uh, you know, will pay him off. Mike representing his local Philadelphia Eagles. It's probably to see Joe not wearing a jersey. Joe's always a sports fan. I do know that yeah, Joe that, that is, is a bit a surprising, especially with the big game coming up in a couple of days here. But Joe is a big I Eagles fan. Guess he's fan. played out the whole Eagles jersey thing. He wore he wore that was an Eagles jersey he wore when he won the main, right? Uh, yeah, I believe. so. Yeah, I know he was wearing some sports thing. I thought it was a Philadelphia Phillies. It might have been. He's he's a fan of both. I mean, there were a couple of days. Sort of he might have gone back and forth. Yeah. Yeah, it was that, a three-day final table. That was that was popularized by by Greg Merson when he wore the Orioles jersey at the yep. final table of the main event and ended up winning. Hey, maybe there's something to it. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. If Mike wins this tournament <laughs> with from from this position, I'm gonna wear a sports jersey every final table Here, I make. Here's my question: Can you think of of somebody who has worn jersey at the final table of the main event, made a big statement, and then didn't go on to win? I I, I think we have a sample size of two, and both people have won. <laughs> That that'd be an interesting question. We might have to we might have to go to uh, go to Twitter for this one. <laughs> someone finds yeah, I us. I suspect there's a bit of a uh, survivor bias. Yeah, someone there, someone finds us. Uh, someone finds us a final table participant that is not one wearing a sports jersey. Uh, you see our Twitter tags flying down below there. You can follow us on Twitter and also at Borgata Poker. You can tweet at us if you have questions, comments, anything you like. Eric moving up with his 6-3 into a pair of sixes. Significant upgrade. Yeah, for sure. Although the 6-3 worked out for him, so. Yeah, that's true. Joe with the king-8 offsuit. Well, good enough to see a call out of the big one. Joe Paris is eight. Joe gets there. Yeah. Be interesting to see if Eric starts betting this at some point. Because Joe will actually probably struggle putting in a lot of chips with this hand. But if Eric just tries to get the like show, Eric just decided yeah. to go into showdown mode. But yeah, generally speaking, on this texture, it's very difficult for the big one to take a lot of pressure. Both players seem content to check it down, and Joe's in a win with the eight. Now, Brian, getting back to the uh, your big blind ranges here when when facing an open, it used to be back in the day that uh, 
the, the ranges you'd choose to 3-bet would be hands that you'd otherwise defend, uh, let's say your 3-bet quote-unquote bluffs. It would be hands that you otherwise, that you could defend profitably, but you're instead going to choose to 3-bet to bluff with them. For example, hands like 6-8 uh, suited, or let's even say ace-deuce suited, um, hands like this. Uh, these days, uh, I guess what, what you're saying is we've seen kind of players just only flat those hands, and then they mix up their 3-betting range. Um, they balance their 3-betting range uh, with their premiums with 3-betting hands like 6-3 off. Well, it kind of depends pretty heavily on the stack depth, because at certain stack depths, you're more worried about getting 4-bet shoved off your hand, whereas in the stacks, that's no longer going to happen. With deeper stacks, you'd rather... It's like we're losing Brian a little bit there. <laughs> Technology is marvelous, but not all the time. In that spot where he squeezed in the relatively short stack depth, you'd rather use a hand with just no equity at all because it's pretty unlikely that you're going to have to. Okay, so uh, what I hear you saying is that if it's likely that you're going to, that y your opponent will be able to defend, um, then you want to choose hands that can actually flop some equity. Yeah, exactly. So your range should change pretty heavily based on the stack depth, I think. Another comment from the chat here. Seeing that 3-bet with 6-3 off, does that help Eric protect his blinds better? I think the better way of looking at it is, well, I, I think that's an interesting concept of, of you know, kind of protecting your blinds. Uh, let's just say it's going to make people a little more hesitant to, to open into him, that's for sure. Knowing that he yeah, may he just... will he will pick up some amount of equity on future hands from people opening less into his yeah, blind. Yeah, so exactly. There, there's definitely a factor to that. I uh, get kind of surprised to see Zach not see about this this gutter on this board. Yeah, I'm quite surprised to see Zach take more passive line here as well. Yeah, another another big note. If I were at the final table, I would take away from that would be that if um, if Eric is behind and somebody opened, I'm not going to flat uh, and give Eric a, a squeeze spot with speculative hands, and I may do that with some stronger holdings as well. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point for sure. Justin Zaki with 16 career WPT caches, and this is his first final table, or is this his second one? I believe this is his second. Okay. Yeah, that sounds I think right. that I that's, that is, at least one. Yeah, I believe he found table something in Florida. That's I know he just, plays a Justin lot. Justin Zaki, live. his his biggest uh, live tournament score came back in 2011. It was a 10k at the uh, Hollywood Hard Rock in Florida. He cashed for about 416 thousand dollars. He does have a 1.8 million in tournament earnings. Uh, however, his last three-figure score came all the way back in 2013, so this is a huge spot for him. Uh, he plays very, very well, but it, it seems like I, in the tournaments uh, I go deep, you know, Justin's always around, and then he always somehow, you know, kind of busts in 15 to 25th place. Uh, so, you know, very exciting moment for him to be here at the final table, and exciting moment for Mike right now, who has pocket kings and has Eric coming along. Yeah, this could be a big one here. Eric just calling with ace queen. Joe not even thinking about entering the pot there That's with the jack nine suit. Not a Joe McKeon situation. This is this is what I mean by Joe stepping carefully. That's a you know Joe Joe cut his teeth online back in the day before Black Friday, um, in the in the time where people you know didn't do a lot of flatting. Uh, Joe is definitely not the type to like overcall super wide there and. Um, what about like three betting? I think you may see him 3-bet, but with Mike has a pretty short stack, I don't think you're going to see him really go too crazy in that sort of situation. He's going to pick pretty good hands to do it with. You know, yeah, he, Joe I, is I, just going to play like pretty solid poker overall, I think, and just rely on his post-flop edges to get him through here. You're I not going to see him step too far out of line. Yeah, I think you'll see him open up a lot more when you get a little shorter-handed. Yeah, that, that's definitely true. Yeah, I see. It uh, uh, looks like Zaki... Uh, uh, Justin Zaki, final table, the lucky WPT Lucky Hearts back in 2014 um, for a final table. He also got ninth in WPT Jacksonville Best Bet, but I guess maybe – and he also got ninth – okay, wait, hold on a second. Okay, I guess these aren't official final tables because official final table is well, six. Here we, here we have uh, Michael going all in, Eric hitting the queen on the turn, snap calling. Ooh. Eric has five outs to eliminate 
Michael Martyr going to the river, and that will not be one of them. Michael Martyr doubles up here against Eric, and Eric, who started off so strong, floats the nine high flop, catches top top on the turn, and it's a uh, nice pop for Michael Martyr, and so far the jersey's paying off. The jersey off. is working out. Yeah, unfortunate turn for Eric here. When you call this type of a flop with ace-queen and you turn a queen, I mean, you're just... You're just dreaming. This is, like, amazing. You, you just can't believe that he's going to go all in now. Um, you know, kind of unfortunate to run into an overpair like that. New breath of life for Mike, Definitely a, a great start for Eric, but it only takes one bad hand to undo a lot of progress, and uh, that was an unfortunate spot for him to be sure. So why, why, in your opinion, should Joe not even consider a three bet with the Jack-9 suited there on the button? In a squeeze spot. I don't think it's the worst thing to consider, but I mean, Mike was only opening off of like less than two million. You know, once you have Eric calling, like, what are you gonna make it? Like seven, six hundred, seven hundred thousand, and then Mike's gonna shove, and you're gonna fold, or well, I find call? I find the, the beauty of that spot is that Joe could actually make his sizing smaller than if Mike were deeper and, and had a stack that he could flat. Maybe. I mean, that's that's a possibility. But even so, you're still kind of left with the awkward situation of. You know, if Mike shoves, then what? You know, do you fold? Do you call? Both those options don't seem amazing. Right. And Jack Nine's like not really strong enough. Like if he had like, let's say Joe had like King Queen suited, where you could just kind of three bet, and then if Mike goes all in, you're like, all right, maybe we'll be flipping. Let's you know hope for the best. You know, there's a big difference between a you know a hand that's stronger versus a Jack Nine. Jack Nine just in that awkward range where, you know, it's it's just not great. I think if he was going to play that hand, his best option probably would be to call, but. You know, like I said, Joe's not that type. Joe's not the type to get into a sticky three-way post-flop spot where you're shorter stacked and maybe forced to stack off with top pair that you know he wouldn't want to have to do. Zach, it's no action there with the ace king suited. Joe referencing his multiple re-entries in this tournament that he's been writing about in his bios several times. But they've paid off for him because here he is. Yeah, re-entry structures do favor the uh, the more experienced players as, you know, being able to take multiple shots makes it more likely you'll go deep in the tournament. So Steven is now our short stack. Uh, Steven Sung from Connecticut. Where in Connecticut is he from? Greenwich, Connecticut. Born in New York. Uh, he's not a super well-known face, I don't think, on the live circuit, but he's definitely played his fair share of hands. He's uh, an online professional that is quite good. He's been doing quite well lately, and I think we're going to see a lot more of him, especially after a big run here. I played with him yesterday. He was playing very well. Um, he was the chip leader for most of the day yesterday. Then when it got down to 10-handed, uh, things started kind of going south for him, and uh, Zach got a very good uh, run of cards. And uh, things can change very, very quickly in, in live tournament poker. I'm going to say I'm going to be confused several times because of Zach and Zachy. Because Justin Zachy is well-known just by the name Zachy. So... Gonna have to. You're gonna have to be uh, focused today. <laughs> Steam with the ace two suited. A very good hand for the position, but as the shortest stack, it does get a little bit awkward to uh, play hands like this. Yeah, he only has about 1.7 million or so. I'm gonna see him go for a limping strategy here, which is definitely a. Uh, a nice way to play his stack in this sort of spot, I think. Especially if Not something everybody has in their arsenal. Yeah, especially if Eric, is, uh, it out. if Eric is going to you know, put a lot of pressure on him. He's opening into Eric and then uh, the chip leader. You know, so it's, it's going to be definitely a little difficult for him to do a lot of raising here. But this could spell trouble. Eric with a boat. Yeah.
a one outer boat at that. Yeah, Steven can get in a lot of trouble in this spot here. I mean, if, if Eric raises here, I don't think we're going to see anything but Steven shoving here. Well, it looks like he does raise. Just a min raise to 350,000. And this is the problem with playing a limp strategy like Steven has done here, is when you do limp and you let the small blind and the big blind in on any paired board like this, there's a lot of tens out there. Now, uh, I would, uh, against a min raise here, I would just be flatting. Um, but Steven does go all in. He'll get the bad news, and he has about 1% equity in the pot. Running 10s or running aces. Or I guess he is a running four, five, straight flush. Four, five, yeah. five of final hearts. Table. That's not going to do six, it. Very unfortunate for Steven, because if Eric had a 10, then he would still be fairly live. He'd have at least like 25% or whatever, but against the main full house, he is close to dead on the flop. Uh, they're going to count the, the chips because they're pretty close in in stack here. But I, I believe that Steven's going to be our sixth place finisher. That Eric does have him covered by a few. Uh, that's a brutal way to go out after being chip leader for uh, you know most of the down the stretch. But like you said, things can change very quickly in poker tournaments. Joe saying that he covers. I tend to believe Joe here. Steven Sung is our sixth place finisher here today, and he goes home with $138,254 for his efforts. And that will be his uh, biggest, uh, I'm sorry, second biggest live tournament score. No, that is his biggest live tournament score. I think score. that's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that brings him up to over 400000 in live tournament earnings and, and Steven uh, again online backgrounds uh, played very very well um, but uh, you know caught some caught some bad luck yesterday and then coming in today obviously uh, caught a lot of bad luck there flopping the nut flush draw against a, a made boat he goes home in sixth place and is now there, we're down to five is there really any way he can you, you mentioned you would just call the check raise there you know it, even after the aggression we've seen Eric put on. You don't think there's any way Eric's just kind of trying to represent that 10? You wouldn't rather just try to end the pot now and kind of take it down or try but to if, run if your Eric is If Eric is bluffing, then wouldn't I prefer to just call the turn? I mean, maybe, but, you know, it's still going to be hard to navigate on a lot of different turns with the, with that stack. I mean, Stacks if I've, are it, quite short in that yeah. spot, so I don't think getting it in with the nut flusher on the flop was really unreasonable at all. I, don't, I, do, I certainly don't think it's unreasonable. I just don't know why it would be better than calling. Well, Eric might also uh, call with a worse flush draw on the flop there. That's true. That's true, but wouldn't he shove the turn? Yeah, probably. Maybe. I, I'd be I, a just little, don't see, I just don't see a situation in which it's I, better. I'd be a little concerned that Eric would be doing something like raising a hand like a three to yeah, kind of see what happens. Lettuce. Okay, so that's... If, um, if or Eric a hand like pocket raised, fours or fives or something like if that. If Eric is raised folding fours or fives, then absolutely, yeah. You know, I, I just I just think that, like, when you have that short of a stack, it's kind of like, I don't want this guy to, you know, I don't want to just call and then have Eric to shove the turn and just turn over king three and go, ah, you got me. And then I'm like, uh, ha, ha, I'm in trouble. Right. I also think it's a if little think different. If you that that's, that's a legitimate case, then absolutely Well, I think not. it's a little different if his flush draw is a little stronger. I mean, if he has, like, ace nine of hearts or something like that, where he just has more outs to that, you know, that bottom card, uh, that bottom pair, then I'm okay with calling. Okay. But... One of the benefits of, of flatting there is that there are five cards that you can fold on the turn, and any ten or three. Sure. Sure. Um, it would also be different if, if Eric had made it a, a different size, but he was, uh, you know, in a spot. But either way, we're uh, nitpicking here. It was a situation that, that kind of played itself. He was going to go with it on most, almost every turn anyway. Um, certainly on the six of hearts, which was the turn. So we're seeing Joe float the flop here with Jack-10 of hearts and get there on the turn. Check, check. And now Joe with the best hand. See if he tries to value bet it or is content to check it down. I suspect the latter. What do you, what do you think was going through Joe's head here on the flop? Uh, over cards to the seven, backdoor hearts, 
I mean, you, you have to load a lot of hands here or else you're just overfolding the flop like really quickly. So I, I assume Eric made it a pretty small size. I didn't actually see, but given the way Eric's been sizing his post flop C bets, I think it's a perfectly reasonable float for Joe. And we're going to see him go for like a very small value on the river here, which I like. It's like Eric's considering. Is he considering raising? Mm. Yeah. yeah. If Eric raises, that's pretty nice for him. I don't. If he calls, he's not going to like it, but... Wow. Eric with the rates. Eric keeping on the aggression here. We'll yeah. see if Joe manages to make the call. I mean, I wouldn't put it past him. He's very good at reading hands. Eric's not going to have that many hands that check the river and then legitimately want to... I mean, check the turn and then legitimately want to raise the river. There's just not that many of them. Like, most of his flushes are probably betting the turn. Yeah, Joe calls. Wow, Joe makes Great the call. call. Nice call by Joe. Indeed. Very well played hand by Joe, and that you're seeing right there why he's just one of the best. Fantastic call there by Joe McKeon. So when he bet, do you think he was hoping to induce a raise? I don't think you're hoping. Yeah, I think it's one of those situations where he's like, well, if he just calls, I probably have the best hand, and if he raises, I'll kind of figure it out because he doesn't, you know, necessarily represent that many hands. Um, Joe has definitely played with Eric a lot, though, so it, it may have been something he was just, just anticipating. Every time I watch Joe play, I'm just incredibly impressed, and uh, that is an excellent example of why. Mm -hmm. 